and in the next life. This morning, I feel grateful, Brother Robert. I feel so grateful to God for what he's done for me. Listening to the songs this morning, I'm so thankful. So thankful. You know, I could, I think of, you know, Brother Chad was singing that song, and I uh, just want to thank you. Hear Sister Joyce's testimony. I know the backstory of that song, and Brother Harold's testimony, and uh, I want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You couldn't tell him enough. You couldn't tell God enough. Thank you. Sister Joyce used to sing that song, If I Had a Million Years, a Million, Million Years to Live, I'd Spend Them All at the Throne. Is that how it goes, Sister Sarah? Is that the one I'm thinking of? <laughs> but I, I would see her testimony and how she would praise the Lord and how thankful she was for where God brought her from. And Brother Harold would say that he... You know, he reached way down in the miry clay, and he brought me out of that miry clay, and he set my feet on a, a solid rock, and he brought me into that marvelous light. And this morning, that's how I feel. I feel thankful. I feel so, so good this morning, what, what I know that God has done for me. I'm grateful that I, I realized that. Brother Terry talked about having revelation of, of the truth, revelation of the gospel, and the thing, that got, the thing that has been most important in my life, that has been the most productive, that has been the most influential, is this Word of God. Yeah. And it has been so good. It has been so good to be able to go back to this in every situation. You heard the testimonies this morning. You know, difficulty, we'll have those. We'll have afflictions. We'll have trials. We'll have temptations. The devil will probably get the better of you once in a while. And we're human, but don't let him get you... Don't let them keep getting you. Get over it. Put them where he's supposed to be. Put your heel on him and put him where he's supposed to be in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I tell him once in a while, you got me. You got me, but I can't stand you. I hate you even more. Amen. But you'll have afflictions, but get back to this word. You'll have, you'll have times in life when it seems like you just couldn't go forward. You can't take another step. You don't even know how. If you, if, how could you even breathe? You, you'll have those situations, and you've been in those situations, but get back to this Word of God and see what it will do for you. This Word will comfort. This Word will restore. This Word is so careful. This Word is so considerate. If you get back to this Word, this is exactly what it is that will give you comfort, that will give you restoration, that will give you everything that you need <laughs> in your darkest time, in your most needful time, in the time when you're hurting the most, Get to the Word of God. It just, you know, if you don't even, if you can't even find the strength to read it, just hold it in your hand and think this is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And so many times I've held it right here. So many times you've probably done the same, Lord. That this was the only thing that could comfort you in this life. And, and this is what it does for me. Sister Tammy, I know we've talked. This is the thing that comforts and your greatest need. This is it. This is the thing that you can depend on when all other things fail in this life. This is the thing that you can count on. The thing that you can depend on. The thing that will bring you true joy. The thing that will bring you true peace. The thing that will give you rest in this life. This Word of God. This life-saving Word of God. This infallible truth of God is the thing. He's a single answer right here. I'm so grateful this morning. That's how I feel this morning. I feel grateful this morning. I feel, feel grateful for what it is that God has, has allowed me to see, what he's allowed me to know, and that he's showed in love. He's shown himself to me in love and in mercy. When I didn't deserve it, I, I, I didn't feel like I deserved it. You probably feel the same way, but he thought enough of you. He thought highly enough of you that he thought and considered you, and he thought that you deserved what he had done. He, he looks at you and he says, you deserve my life on a cross. You deserve my life, the Savior, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He looked at you. He looked through, through the generations. He looked down through time and he looked at your life and he said, you deserve my life as king on a cross. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that. The one that gives you breath of life. He thought, he looks at you and he says, you deserve it. You're worthy. His blood makes you worthy. Amen. He's so good. I want to go to the book of 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. I'm going to 
I'm going to read 6 through 8. Say praise the Lord if you get to 1 Timothy there. 6th chapter, 6th verse, 1 Timothy. says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And let the whole church pray that God would bless his word this morning. Mighty King, lead us in truth this morning, Lord, mighty God. Edify this people for your glory alone, mighty God. Help us to walk a narrow way, Lord. Lead us in your word. Lord, mighty God, give us a heart to receive and a mind to understand this morning. In your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I think about being content in Jesus Christ. I, I think about how, how it is that the devil will manipulate you and he'll try to play tricks with you and he'll try to convince you to be unhappy. He'll try to convince you that you don't have everything that you want, you don't have everything that you need even, but he'll, he'll try to mess with your mind and he'll try to get you to a place of discontentment. A place where there is no joy. He'll try to get you to a place where you're always looking for the next best thing. You're always waiting for the next thing to happen. The thing that will, that will keep you interested or keep you uh, enthused or encouraged or, or inspired. When all that it really should take is this word of God. When you read this word of God, is this not inspiration enough? To know, well, like we've already talked this morning, that the Savior of the world, the Creator of all mankind, the one that hung the moon and the stars, and He said, let there be light, and there was light, He spoke that into existence, that He took man out of the dust of the ground, and He breathed the breath of life into His nostrils. Isn't that inspiration enough? Shouldn't that be inspiring enough? But instead, the devil has us looking at our neighbors. The devil has us looking at the rest of the world saying, I wish I had what they had. I wish I could be like they are. I wish I could get, I wish I had the bank account that they had or the car that they're driving or the house that they're living in. The devil has a funny way to get us separated from God or disinterested from God. Discontentment. The Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. Not godliness alone, but godliness with contentment. Being content in God. Being content in Jesus Christ. Being content in this infallible word that this is enough. This is actually sufficient. I think of social media all the time. You know, it's on my mind. And probably think of how the devil uses that. And people want to make an argument that it's, you know, there's good there. and There may be. I don't know. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. I don't like to partake in it myself. But there's, I see an evil there because you see the glimpses of the best parts of people's lives most often. You see them in a perfect setting. They doctored the picture up or they staged a photo with their family. <laughs> it reminds me of the Dukes of Hazard, <laughs> the General Lee. <laughs> we had a picture down in Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains with our sons. We took our sons down there. To the Smoky Mountains and we're enjoying the vacation and wanted to get a picture of Bone Luke by the General Lee. And them kids were throwing a royal fit. <laughs> I mean crying and throwing a fit and they did not want to be there and for some, something made them unhappy and they were just little guys. But in a picture you would never tell it. My goodness, they looked as happy as could be. They was just minding their business and they were doing things the right way and you looked at that picture and they were just, you know, but if you would have seen it 10 seconds before that, they was in a miserable place. Like, you're going to stand next to the car, and you're going to get your picture taken. Now smile. <laughs> and, that, and that's what the devil does for us, though. He gives us a glimpse of the best things, and he wants us to, he wants us to covet the best things of other people's lives. He wants us to look at things that we don't have. 
And he wants us to spend our time desiring those things that we don't have or that God wouldn't allow us to have or maybe God didn't think you could deal with or that God didn't think that you could handle, but you desire them anyways. The devil has you looking for them. But the Bible says contentment, godliness with contentment is great gain. I was thinking of that, that song Brother Tony started off. He said, if I've, I've had a dollar to my name, and you, you probably can relate. I can relate. I've had a dollar to my name. I've had friends that walked away. It goes on to say, if I got Jesus, I got all that I could ever need. If I got Jesus, I got all that I could ever need, all that I could ever desire, all that I could ever want. I've, I've known that time when I've had a dollar to my name. I've known that time when you, you couldn't hardly get two nickels to rub together and you were working nonstop because you had the little babies at the house and you was trying to support them and provide for them and then you didn't know where the next meal was going to come from because it was like, man, the money is going out too fast. And you had to depend on God. You had, to, you had to depend on God providing for you. You had to trust that God was going to take care of you. I know what that's like. You've heard the refrigerator story. That's a true story. When, when God, you know, the time, and it, it sounds funny, but when we got to the point when I remember Bo was just a little guy. And Luke, I think he was just born, wasn't he? And we, we had to keep milk in the house. We had to feed the kids, and the refrigerator started going out. So... The refrigerator went out, and we was using the freezer as a refrigerator. The freezer was still working. The refrigerator was just a cabinet at that point. You couldn't keep anything in it. that You had to uh, only, can, only can food. That's all you could keep in there, brother. <laughs> but the freezer, now, we had a little tiny freezer that was working, and I knew that any second that thing was going to quit on me. Any minute that thing was going to quit, and the babies needed to have milk. And you think, I remember going to the bank and trying to get a loan for a refrigerator for $1,000, and they said no. <laughs> Imagine that. that. That's, you know, $1,000, and the bank said, I, I don't think you can afford it. I don't think you can make the payments on it. I don't know what they was thinking. But they said no, we're not going to give you $1,000. So we had to do something different. I had to believe, and we had to trust that God was going to provide, and God did provide. And, you, and if you remember the end of the story, I, I remember telling this story probably 15 or 20 years ago. I went to work the day that the freezer quit working as a refrigerator. And now all it was was a yard ornament, the whole entire thing. I walked into work and I sat down in our morning meeting and the guy said, hey, you know anybody that needs a refrigerator? <laughs> I, oh, I said, oh yeah. I know somebody that needs a refrigerator. He goes, well, my refrigerator been leaking all over the kitchen, and I can't figure it out. And I said, I'll be over to look at it. Went over there, and he had a, that drain tube on the back of it was plugged solid, and I took an air hose and pff, blew it out. And this refrigerator, I'm not kidding, it was this tall, this big. This is a beautiful refrigerator. <laughs> the best thing i ever seen for refrigerators go. Put that in that trailer, and God provided in an instant when I needed him to. And it sounds simple, it sounds like a small thing, but to me that was encouraging, that was God moving, that was God making a way when there was no way. That was God taking care of me. When I was depending on Him, that was God taking care of me. He is a wonderful God. He is grateful and greatly to be praised. And when you're content with God, when He is all that you need, then life sure is a little easier, isn't it? Life is sure a little easier when God it becomes all that you desire, all that you need, all that you want, and you can find contentment. Because in this world, in this life, the flesh will never be satisfied, will never be full, and will never be content. But if you live in the Spirit, you'll deny the lust of the flesh, and you can satisfy. You can live a satisfied, fulfilled life living for Jesus Christ. So good. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. The fifth verse says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Our sufficiency is of God. Not in myself. Not that I'm a great provider. Not that I'm a great person. Not that I have great ability. Not that I have 
any merit to myself or any credit to my name, but that God, all my sufficiency is in Jesus Christ. I depend on Him completely. For health, I depend on God. For finances, I depend on God. For relationship, I depend on God. For every aspect of my life, every facet of my life, I depend on God. In every facet of my life, I want to find contentment in God. Amen? In all facets of my life, I want to be content. And Jesus Christ makes me content. I know, you know, living, living separate from God, you cannot have contentment. I never found it. Brother Gene, have you? I've never found it outside of living for God. I've never found contentment. You think, yeah, I could find a place in the hills, and I could watch the sun come up over the mountain. I could have a little trout stream bubbling down, and I could catch brookies all day long feeding the family, and I would be content, but not without Jesus Christ I wouldn't be. Not without God for sure I wouldn't be. I'll be the, of all men most miserable. But I have Jesus Christ, and he is what I hope in. <laughs> Philippians, the fourth chapter, and I'll do a little piece of reading here. Philippians, the fourth chapter, and I'll go to... Uh, the 11th verse. 4, 11 through 13. It says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I like that. Paul said in, in that first verse, that 11th verse, he says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am. He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am. What I ha it's a learned thing to be content. With God. It's a learned thing that you, you, it's a learned thing. It's not something that is natural to the flesh to be content. The flesh it has a hard time being content. Matter of fact, I said it already, the flesh will not be content. That's why Paul so often says, live after the spirit, not after the flesh. If you live after the spirit, you will deny the lust of the flesh. But he said, I have learned wherewithal, in whatever state I am. Whatever state I am, whether I'm abased or whether I abound, whether it's time of plenty or time of famine, I have learned to be content. Where do I learn that? From this word, from reading this word of God, from praying to the king, from getting down on my knees and being in conversation and fellowship with God, the one ma the maker, the one single God, Jesus Christ the Lord. With him, I learn how to be content in whatever state I am in, because He is all that I can depend on. And if you're looking anywhere else for contentment, you're not going to find it. You're not going to find contentment in love, not a love of a human being. That'll help. God said He created a woman for the man. He, he made her a helpmate to the man. It's nice to have a helpmate, isn't it, Brother Dennis? Someone to help you along. Someone that God created for you. Someone that God put on the planet for you to help you get through life. But you're not going to find contentment there if you don't have Jesus Christ. A marriage don't work without Jesus Christ. A, a, a marriage, it don't work like it has potential to work without God. A family don't thrive like it has potential to thrive without God. No relationship works like it could work without God. If you take care of the things of God first, then everything else will be all right. If you put first the, the things of the kingdom of God, all these other things will follow. But Paul said, I learned how to be. I learned how to be content. I learned through study, through long-suffering, through patience. I've learned how to be content with wherever I'm at in life. And you see it so often, I, I, you know, I, I keep going back to it, but it's like the devil, if he can keep you discontent, he has you right where he wants you. 
If you can't even find peace and contentment in God because you're so worried because the devil has you focused on the things of this world, then he has you right where he wants you. He has you exactly where he wants you. Will you have troubles? Sure, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have financial troubles. You're going to have troubles from the day you were born to the day you leave this planet. You're going to have troubles. It's not going to be any different for you. It's not going to be any different for me. You're going to have troubles and they're going to be there. But you have God, brother, already testified. You have God to lean on. You have God to trust in. Brother Brad sang that song. I think about that, brother Brad. The Bible said, he didn't say he'll give you everything that you ever wanted in the flesh. But he said, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. Brother Brad sang that song, the blood, you know, check and see if the blood's still there. I guarantee you that the blood is still there, that the blood is still doing the job that the blood is designed to do. The blood is still restoring. The blood is still saving. The blood of Jesus Christ, that you, if you went down in the water in the name of Jesus Christ in baptism and you rose up a new creature, you applied the blood of Jesus Christ to your life, it's still there. It's still trying to do what it had, was designed to do. you got to trust it. He, the blood is not going to go away. The blood is still there for you. The blood is still the thing that you need. The blood is still the thing that we all need. The blood of Jesus Christ. And, and think about that. How does the devil convince us? I, I, I was just, as he was singing that song today, I was thinking, how does the devil convince us to be unhappy because the circumstances of life, when God gave us everything that he, that he could ever give us, he gave us the very best of himself. But, and and we, we, we just, we look past that a lot of times. We look past that. We look beyond that. We look at our circumstance and then we don't, even, we don't even remember because of our circumstances, we don't even consider the, the great thing that God has done for you, the great thing that God has brought you from the darkness because the devil has us focused on things that we shouldn't be focused on. The Bible says, He that warreth entangleth himself not with the affairs of this life, that he may please him that has chosen him to be a soldier. Amen? I, Jesus Christ is the captain of my life. I, I love it, Brother uh, Denton. One of my favorite messages he gave, he was talking about a man that was a soldier. And he said that a soldier, when he don't have a war to fight, when there's not a battle to fight, there's not a battle raging, he said he'll, the soldier, he'll play cards and he'll gamble and he'll smoke and he'll drink. But you give that soldier a battle to fight and he will lay all that down and he will go do the job that he was called to do. And I think of that in Jesus Christ. We have a work that is nonstop. It's never ending. We have a work to do. We have a battle to fight. From day one, we have a battle that we're engaged in. And if you are a soldier, a true soldier of Jesus Christ, you will be about your father's business and you will want to put down the things of life and you will want to walk towards the war, walk towards the battle, walk into the battle, face the enemy head on and face him with the word of God and be content with what it is that God has given you to be in this life. Amen. We don't need more than what God has given us. I believe he's a great provider. I believe he's more generous than anyone I've ever known. I believe he's more diligent than anything or anyone I've ever known. He's a diligent protector, wonderful, generous provider. I believe that. Hebrews, the 13th chapter. This is just where my heart is at. I, I see it, and, and I see it mostly, you know, I see it in young people. Young people are so, I'm in... And I don't know, maybe I was that way a little bit. I don't, I don't know. We didn't have, we was outside from dusk till dawn. And probably a lot of you older ones were. I remember, you know, especially, I remember mom coming out in the wintertime and it was cold and it was dark and it was as late as she would possibly let us stay out and she would scream at us to get back in the house. It's time. You've been out here long enough. But we was out there playing and having fun and enjoying life. And I, and I think about the young people today I might go to a family event and not a, not a single young person walks out the door because they're right here like this. They're all right here like this. Do, 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 do. Or they got a little, and they're all right here going, pop, 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 pop. Never walk out the door. Never have to have an imagination. Never have to have anybody to play with because they just take care of it right here. Whatever it is that the world wants them to see, they have it right here. <laughs> and, uh, and you wonder how come they're not content. 
You wonder how come they're not content. I remember a teacher trying to, one of the teachers in elementary school trying to tell me my youngest son, <laughs> he needed to be put on uh, some drug to calm him down or something. <laughs> I said, you must be out of your mind. I asked the guy, are you a doctor? Nope. I said, so you think that you're a teacher. You was educated as a teacher, but you think that by your authority or by your wisdom, my son should be put on medicine to change his men mental state or change his capacity or change the way he would do things? Is that, nah, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. Because I want him to still be a boy. I still want him to do things that I want him to do things that he's inclined to do, that nature inclines him to do. I want him to go outside and play. I want him to daydream. I want him to have an imagination. I want him to think on things. I don't want to, do, I don't want to fog his reality. And drugs will do that. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not trying to get into that with your kids if you have something like that. But that's, I think about young people on drugs right now. On marijuana and meth. And, you know, I've, I've known a couple young people that I've coached through football that died smoking marijuana that was laced with fentanyl and didn't have a clue. And they went upstairs, the one young man went upstairs and his grandpa's house and he went upstairs in the bedroom he just got done eating a chocolate chip cookie with his grandpa sitting at the kitchen table drinking a glass of milk and he went upstairs and he smoked a little bit of marijuana that he didn't know was laced and never woke up and he was 19 17 or 17 18 19 years old and young people they turn to that to to cloud their reality to dim their reality and I think a lot of times it's probably because the devil has them thinking that their life is worthless or that they, they, they just they can't be happy with their life. They can't be content with their life, with the situation that they're in. So they want to they wanna live in a fog. And that's the way that the man that turns to the bottle, he wants to live in a fog. I have, I have a friend that he lived, spent his life living in the fog on the bottle every night after work, go home, and he would drink a fifth. And I would counsel with him and talk to him and beg him, listen, you have, you have a family, a beautiful family. You have a beautiful daughter, two beautiful daughters, a beautiful wife. You have everything that a man could want. Be careful with what you're doing. And he couldn't stop because for some reason the devil had him convinced that he needed something else. The devil had him depressed in his circumstance. The devil had him unhappy with where he was living. And every night he would go home and imagine every night you would drink a fifth of whiskey every night. You can't function like that. You come to work, you still can't function. You go home at night, you do the same thing, and you know what happens. Eventually, your wife gets tired of that. Now your family leaves. You have no daughters. You have no wife. You have an empty home and a broken heart. Because the devil wants you to be convinced that that's what's going to take care of you. That is, that, there's nothing there for you in the bottle or in the drugs or in anything that the world has to offer. I think if the devil can keep people discontent, then he can get them to turn to things that the world wants them to turn to, that, the, that he wants them to turn to, that will distract them from God and keep them separate from God. Okay, did I read Hebrews? No, I didn't. 13th chapter. Start at verse 5. It says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Let your conduct or your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Listen to this. Is this something to be content about? He says, for he hath said, he's trying to convince you, the reader, He's trying to convince you, the reader, that you have something better than what the world has to offer. He's trying to, he's trying to get you to look, take a deep look in this. Jesus Christ said, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. I will never leave you stranded. I will never leave you alone. I will never leave you comfortless. I'm going away, but I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to leave a comforter for you. I'm going to leave a comfort for you. I'm going to leave the Holy Ghost to lead you and guide you in truth. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm never going to forsake you. But the, the, the author is trying to get you to understand that you have everything that you need. 
God himself is not going to leave you. He's on your side. He wants you to have victory. He's on your side. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to leave you. And in that alone, you should be content. In that alone, you should, have, you should be satisfied. You should find joy. Because my joy, it truly does not depend on my circumstance. If my joy depended on my circumstance, I would be miserable all the time. Some, because of things that you have to deal with at work, things that you have to deal with in the world, because of things that you have to deal with in finances, because people disappoint you, because family disappoints you, because people will fail you, because that's just what we do. People do that. You have one thing that you can trust, that's God. Then he goes on to say, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear. When I get into a situation where I need God, when you get there, count on God. Look to Him. Look to Him alone. Depend on Him. Ask Him for favor. To be in favor of God, my goodness, how to be- what a beautiful thing. To have favor with the king, what a beautiful thing. That he would have show you enough favor to give you the truth and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That he would let you understand and know that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Amen. That he would let you know that he alone, that God himself robed himself in the flesh. That you have revelation of this. That you know. You know what it takes. That you know that it takes the blood applied to your life for you to have salvation. That you know he gave you the revelation to know that this corruptible will this this corruptible will put on incorruption. That this mortal will put on immortality. That's a that's not a fairy tale. That's the true thing. That's a re, that's the reality of our salvation. And I and I'm saying be content with that. The author is saying be content with that. Be satisfied in Jesus Christ. I'm going to have them come back to the music if they would. Look at 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and I'll stay right there in 2 Corinthians to finish it off, but the 11th chapter. I want you to think of the Apostle Paul. Think of where he is writing from. I've I've talked on this before, and, and you know Paul's circumstance if you read the Bible. Paul, a lot of times, was writing from a prison, writing from a dungeon. He was steadfast. His, the, the one thing, he always said, this one thing I do, that's my favorite thing. This one thing I do. This one thing I do. It, his life was about Jesus Christ and doing the will of God. Well, he denied the flesh and he lived for God. But I want you to think of what he went through. This is Paul's troubles in the 11th chapter. Start at verse 23. And this is Paul. Paul tells us to be content. Paul tells us with godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. This is Paul's life. Can I, can I just put it in a nutshell for you? Can I just wrap it up and tell you what his life was like? He says in the start at verse 21, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we have been weak, howbeit when, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. He says, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, stoned and left for dead. Stoned and left for dead. They thought he, you know, They thought he was dead. God wasn't finished with him. This is Paul's life in a nutshell. And Paul is the one, he's the one that said, godliness with contentment is great gain. But he said, of the Jews, five times, received I forty stripes, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. What does he have to be content about? He has Jesus Christ, that's what. He has Jesus Christ, that is his only hope. He has no hope in anything else. 
He knows he's going to have affliction in this life. The Bible tells us explicitly, yes, you will have afflictions. You will have troubles. You will have heartache in weariness. He says, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and pain, painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily. <laughs> that's, just a, that's just a little bit of it. He's, he just lists all this stuff and he says, that's just a small part of the afflictions I face. But that's nothing. Because I got Jesus Christ. Because I have God. Listen to me. I know your troubles are hard. I know they hurt. I know that life, it gets hard sometimes. But you have something that the world doesn't have. You have, you have something that the world doesn't want to receive. You have Jesus Christ. You have everything to have joy in. You have everything to find contentment in. It's in Jesus Christ. Don't let the devil convince you to look somewhere else. Don't let him convince you to look in another place for happiness, for joy, for contentment. But you are going to find contentment and only find it here in this Bible, in this Word, in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Paul, yeah, he says, that this is just a short list. Not counting all the other things I face daily. And he begged God, take this thing away from me, this thing, this, this thorn in the flesh that, you know, is in history they argued about what it might be and, and, and surely probably some of it was the sin that he, his, his past life, his past probably uh, had to be some of that thorn, maybe physical needs. I've heard people say, you know, his eyesight and everything else it was a spiritual battle. Paul was in a spiritual battle. He said, take this from me. Maybe he struggled with things like that, discontentment in, in Things that he needed God to work on. He said, take this from me. And God said, no, I'm going to leave it with you. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it with you because I called you to be humble. I called you to be a servant. I want you to know that you have need of me. I don't want you to get to the place where you feel so comfortable in life that you forget about me. I don't want you to become rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, not even God. I want you to be in a place that you know you need God and you have nothing else to turn to and if that's what it takes to get you to God, then bring it to me. Amen? I don't want to be so comfortable that I forget about God. I don't want to be rich and increased with goods to the place that I can't even, I don't consider God and I think that I'm a great provider. I'm not a great provider. God is a great provider. He's the only reason that I stand. He's the only reason I get breath of life. He's the only reason I get to put these feet on the ground in the morning. Nobody else. Not something that I did. I can only be content in Him. Listen to 2 Corinthians as we stand in the 12th chapter, the 9th verse. <laughs> Let this sink in. Let this sink in. Understand this. He says, and He said unto me, God said this, Jesus Christ said this. He tells Paul. Paul is giving a testimony. And he's saying, God told me. God said to me. Imagine, Brother Bo, that God spoke to him. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. You, you want to know what you need? You need my grace. You need Jesus Christ. It's all that you need. It's sufficient. It's sufficient. It's what sustains. It, it's what nourishes. It's what restores. It's all that you need. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I'm weak, and he is strong. I am weak, and he is strong, and I find my strength only in him. He is my source of strength. He is my rock and my salvation. He's everything that I need. This morning, you have opportunity that it is unmatched in the world. You have an opportunity of a lifetime to get yourself close to God. You have, a, you have the opportunity of, an, of a lifetime here. There is no better thing that you could devote your life to or that you could commit your energy to than Jesus Christ. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where your walk is at. Some of you I could probably surmise, I could probably guess, and I could, I, I'd probably be right. And Some of you I've seen walk a long time. Some of you I'm not sure. Some of you I just met. 
Some of you I'm seeing out there in the crowd for the first time today. And I don't know exactly where you're living. But I know if you get close to God, He'll get close to you. I know that if you get yourself close to God, you'll find yourself in the right place at the right time all the time. That you'll never be outside of God's will if you put yourself in this word, learning how to be content wherewith God puts you. Amen. I want to be in the right place at the right time. And the only way I'm going to do that is if I'm close to God. We have everything to satisfy this spirit. We have everything that we need. This life is so fleeting, so quickly it goes by. So, so much energy is spent on putting things in barns. So much energy is spent trying to obtain, trying to gain worldly things that will burn in the end, that will do nothing for you, and so little time and energy is spent on the thing that will last the test of time. The thing that will stand when all burnt, when all else burns with fervent heat. And I'm telling you fervent heat, when I read that, to me that tells me that there's going to be nothing left. The only thing left is going to be the Word of God and the work that you've done for Jesus Christ. This is where we find contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. This morning as I open the altar, I want you to come and pour your heart out to God. And I want you to ask Him, help me, Lord, to have contentment. And that's all right. And if you don't know what to pray, and if you don't know how to pray, and you don't know what to say, you come up here with a heart to serve God and you say, help. And He'll be here. He'll quickly come to your side. He'll quickly put His arm around your neck. And He'll quickly start to lead you and start to manipulate and start to mold you into the person that He wants you to be if you so desire. Because the Bible says when you seek God with your whole heart, you will find Him. Amen. This morning, let's open the altar. Let's take time to pray. Let's give God our heart this morning. Pour our heart out to Him. Ask Him. Let Him be everything to you. He will not leave you wanting. Amen. Everybody come. Let's take a little time and pray.